So hello everybody, it's Steve Bates of the BIA. Welcome uh, to this BIA webinar on uh, the Brexit and the general election. Um, I hope what we're able to cover this month are what's going on in the UK in terms of the calling of the snap general election, some of the things that Theresa May, the uh, Prime Minister, has said, some of the things that the European Union have done, uh, particularly with regards to uh, general uh, positioning with Brexit, and uh, then some specific things that have happened with regard to our sector, particularly um, some, uh, the issuing of Brexit advice to companies from the European Medicines Agency and what I think the UK government's position is on that. A little bit on what happens next, what you can do for the life science sector to make sure that we get the best deal and then I'm happy to take some questions which as ever will be through the chat box, uh, uh, type them in and I'll take them uh, at the end. Thank you for joining us and uh, also the other voice you'll hear on this webinar, uh, I'm joined by my colleague Laura Collister uh, who has done a great deal of work in putting this together and we'll take you through where we're at uh, ahead of the general election. So uh, I know that we have a loyal following on, on this and many of you uh, will know, just like your favourite TV shows, that we do a previously on Brexit, a catch up on what we've done before uh, and these were the items that we covered uh, last month in our, in, our, uh, in our webinar so I won't repeat, repeat them, particularly the stuff around uh, trade um, and the Great Repeal Bill or what may happen in Parliament uh, in any great detail but if you're interested they are available on YouTube at the link uh, there at the, the bottom and uh, today's webinar will also be uh, recorded and put up on YouTube if it's of use for colleagues uh, coming soon. So what's new uh, in terms of the UK this month? Uh, I suppose the big news is the UK general election. Yeah. Um, so um, Theresa May um, called a snap general election on the 18th of April um, which was um, to most a complete surprise. I think there had been some speculation about whether she would call an election or not. You know, William Hague had mentioned it a few times and though she denied it, I think there were some people who still thought that she was going to go ahead. Um, BIA has produced a general election timeline. This appears in a blog um, which is on our website and available to members. Um, just running through some of the key dates here, um, obviously it's May the 5th today, it's the BIA Brexit webinar and also the results of the local elections. In the next week or so we'd expect the party manifestos to come through. Following that um, it then goes up to the 8th of June and the election. Um, We'd expect um, soon after the election the Speaker and MPs to be sworn in and then the 19th of June is going to be the State Opening of Parliament and the Queen's Speech. As we've talked about before, um, the Queen's Speech is going to um, include the Great Repeal Bill and this will be a massive piece of legislation where it will take up the majority of the Parliament's time and look at what goes, what stays and what's adjusted um, as we leave the European Union. Um, other Dates to note, um, BIA Parliament Day is still going ahead um, in July um, and that's when we will meet um, some of the um, officials who have already accepted invites and we'll also hopefully meet lots of new MPs, returning MPs and some new MPs potentially. Parliament recess starts on the 20th of July so between the 19th of June and the 20th of July it's going to be very busy in Parliament. Um, Parliament returns on 5th of September for a few weeks before the start of the party conference season. Um, it's going to be an interesting conference season, I think, um, for the winning party. I think there's going to be a lot of pressure around policy development and lots of um, organisations seeking to advocate their positions, which will include BIA, so we'll be going to the Conservative, Labour, Lib Dem and SNP conferences, um, also any parties that have done particularly poorly may have some leadership um, challenges coming up. Um, obviously manifestos aren't out yet, we're expecting them hopefully next week, um, so um, my colleague Martin has taken a look back at the previous manifestos and he published a blog yesterday looking at what were the 2015, 2015 manifestos. Um, here we've pulled out a few things in italics, are those that are in the 2015 manifestos for Labour, we didn't take much out of it um, because there's been such change. So um, I think the big announcement for Labour has been um, to halt all closures of hospitals and A&E departments and have a review of them. They are talking about delivering Brexit but focusing on people um, as the key area. In the Conservatives, um, they have um, their previous manifesto talks about implementing the um, Accelerated Access Review. Um, 
hopefully that will continue to be in their manifesto. Um, BIA has advocated for that and we have um, submitted um, to all the parties a document which asks for the inclusion of the accelerated access review. Um, obviously Theresa May will deliver Brexit, leave the single market and restrict movement of people and industrial strategy should also be in there. Quick little look at um, what the opinion polls are showing. These are from um, the Times YouGov, which was the 2nd and 3rd of May um, opinion poll. Um, in brackets are the results of the 2015 general election. So you can see a big jump up for the Conservatives, but actually not too much of a fall for Labour. Um, biggest fall is obviously UKIP. And then if we have a little look at the local election results, that's actually the fall in UKIP is quite reflected in the local election results. Um, these results um, are from the BBC at 12.30. Since then, I think there's been even more Conservative wins. And um, in Tees Valley, a Conservative mayor has been elected, narrowly defeating Labour, which I think is probably a bit of a surprise for many. Um, few seconds, few minutes on who to look out for. So some potential people that I know sort of post-election, depending on the result that we would seek um, to engage in from a BI perspective. Vicky Ford MEP has been selected for Chelmsford, replacing Simon Burns, who is standing down. It's a very safe Conservative seat. She's done a lot of work in the European Parliament about medical, around medical research and um, is in also on their um, Markets um, Committee. Julian Huppert is standing for Cambridge again. He was the Conservative MP there. He's a former research scientist. And then the other day, Annalise Dodds, um, MEP, was selected for Oxford East, which is a Labour safe seat. Some of the ones, some people sort of potentially facing quite a tough time that BI has worked quite closely with in the past include Daniel Zeichner, who's been a really knowledgeable and dedicated advocate for our sector. Um, he's the MP for Cambridge. Julian Huppert is standing against him, and he only has a majority of 599. But again, as I said before, he's a very dedicated MP. Nicola Blackwood has a much larger majority, but she's been very targeted um, as part of the Open Britain campaign against um, pro-Brexit MPs. Um, also, Norman Lamb has a reasonable majority, but it has, um, his majority was um, Slipped um, between Conservatives and UKIP. So whilst he had um, 19,000 votes last time, the Conservatives had 15 and UKIP had eight. So potentially in for a tough time. And also just to point out, Ian Wright, he's a former minister um, in our sector and was chair of the business um, select committee, is standing down. So <clears throat> thanks, Laura. I think you can see that we've got uh, good insight into uh, a very fast moving situation with the local elections today, I think, being a good bellwether for what might happen. No, 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 uh, no guarantees for the general election. And I think you can see that the BIA is engaged. Uh, Laura and the team are putting a lot of work into providing uh, extra information through the BIA blog uh, and through our website uh, on this. So if you're interested, please um, uh, do dig in and there's some good information uh, there which I hope we've been able to run you through. Um, perhaps I can take the, the, the perspective of what does this mean for, for, for Brexit and back into Brexit. Well perhaps um, uh, an increased majority for the Prime Minister which I think is what the expectation is at the moment should make things easier for the Prime Minister in terms of a, a freer hand in Parliament, the ability to deliver the Brexit that, that she wants. We may see some changes from Remainer to pro-Brexit MPs in the Brexit constituencies. Um, I think it will mean probably uh, a degree of a reshuffle. No parliament is exactly the same uh, going forward. So I imagine that there'll be some changes in the ministerial ranks that may have some knock-on consequences for the, the portfolios and the, the issues that we are, are watching. Uh, and who knows what will happen if uh, certain parties, the Labour Party, UKIP, Lib Dems, don't do as well as they hope. Uh, will there be a period of change with those going forward? Scotland's always worth watching um, because if uh, the SNP did particularly well, obviously there's the whole context of second independence referendum and what happens there. Um, and I think for, for, from our sector, um, what does this mean for life sciences and Brexit? I think the thing I'm, I'm most watching closely for is the impact of campaign rhetoric um, on the negotiation atmosphere. If, if Brexit becomes a key aspect of the campaign, as we expect it to, to and as, as it has already, then it may have an impact on how the UK exits uh, the election campaign, what's been said, and then how that impacts on uh, the negotiations which are going to follow. 
If I can turn from the, the, the general election to, to a, a little bit on what's happened in Brexit this month, um, uh, I think the, the, the famous uh, meeting between um, uh, Juncker and May in Downing Street, uh, of which this picture uh, uh, was taken, and then the interpretations of it, what happened on the date, uh, who, th who, who said what to whom and what do they think of it, uh, is, uh, is been a, a crucial part of the last few weeks. But the big things that have happened are that EU27 have agreed their negotiating posture. Theresa May has called the snap general election. They've had a meeting, uh, which uh, people have different interpretations of the, 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 the deal on it. And from our sector, the EMA has set out plans to be ready if there is a no deal Brexit at the behest of the Commission. But I would say, as always, there is a long, long way to go. Now, you've probably seen in the papers the uh, interpretations of the uh, uh, of, of this uh, famous dinner a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think it depends on whether you read the, the, the press in Germany or the press in the UK uh, as uh, where, where you where you see this from. And those of you who follow uh, uh, TV, if you've watched um, Blind Date back in the day with Silla Black, you'll have seen that sometimes the, the participants uh, take different views on their dates when they, they come away from the date. And if you're more up to date and you're, you're, you follow um, Take Me Out, you know that people have different views on how it went in Fernando's in their interviews at the end of the show. Uh, I think we've seen very much the same with regard to the tweeting. Uh, there's a great piece in the FT today about uh, an entire joke about um, how this may have looked and the interpretations that are put upon it. So part of this that we've got to deal with is that there's going to be some discussions and then interpretations on those discussions as to what has happened during this period of time. And I think, you know, we've just got to put up with this and be aware that there is going to be interpretation upon interpretation and then try and get to the basis of what is fact what is, in fact, as a result of it. As you know, if you are a, uh, an aficionado of, uh, of these webinars, I've tried to make the analogy between Brexit being uh, a long-running, uh, going to be a long-running show. Uh, I was a fan of Dynasty in the 80s, and I think that, uh, you know, some of the feuds are going to be very similar to that which we saw uh, over the, the great 80s, along with the great shoulder pads that you saw in this, this, uh, this, uh, this series. And um, where are we at now? Well, perhaps we've got to the interesting bit where there's one of the first fights. I'd say the long running grapple begins, but I'd say if you're a fan of Shakespeare, it's only act one, scene three. This is a multi-dimensional play. It's going to go on for a long period of time. So don't get too head up with where the, uh, where the action has got to uh, within the first month. What's happened in the EU position? So as you know, we have the Colbys and the Carringtons. I like to, to think of, uh, of the EU as the, the Carringtons, hence the picture here in the bottom right hand corner. Um, uh, but uh, the, um, the, the EU have agreed their negotiating position and the next council meetings are coming uh, against this time frame. They've been pretty clear as to how they want to go about the Brexit negotiations, uh, and I won't rehearse this in great detail, but there are core principles, balance of rights and obligations, level playing field, no sector by sector deal, um, conducted transparently and as a single passage, package. Uh, I think the interesting bits are perhaps the bits around uh, Ireland, um, uh, the, the view of the unique circumstances of the island of Ireland. We need to think of a, a, a way of avoiding a hard border. Um, I think that there is mention of the uh, future location of the seats of EU agencies and facilities located in the UK need to be settled rapidly and arrangements should be found to facilitate their transfer and I think that impinges on the work that the EMA have then gone on to do. Uh, and trade agreements can't be, uh, can be finalised and concluded once the UK is no longer a member state. So uh, I think that this is, um, this is very clear and it's the way that the, uh, the, the European Union want to, uh, wants to play it. So that's, uh, that's out there and agreed. I think that that's also led to the uh, more recent um, proclamations from the European Medicines Agency, both in terms of their guidance to marketing authorisation holders. Apologies if you're not in deep into the regulatory scene, but you'll know that this is an important part of the work that we've been doing. What's the future of European um, uh, medicines regulation and how does the UK uh, have a, a future in that or not is obviously a key question for our sector. Uh, and I put a picture here of, uh, of Fallon from the, the from, from Dynasty. She is of course the, the daughter of, uh, of, uh, of Alexis, and perhaps uh, the EMA has a has a, uh, a role a bit like Fallon, where she is the the, the, the daughter of the, the UK and the EU, and she's because she's conflicted, but she has to do at this stage uh, what her dad says, uh, which is the European. Uh, union uh, and has published the notice explaining people what they should do, remind people of legal obligations in the preparation for Brexit. In terms of the UK, 
Um, hence the picture of Alexis, uh, the, the Colby's. I've just to give out this question. It's an answer to a parliamentary question in the UK Parliament, asked by uh, the Labour MP Helen Goodman, who's the MP who has a significant uh, GSK manufacturing site in her constituency of, uh, uh, in Bishop Auckland, the Barnard Castle site. Answered by Mr. Robin Walker, who is the Minister for Dexu uh, uh, last week. Um, uh, and I think the, the interesting answer here from the UK government, you know, what will, so Helen asked what assessment he's made on the effect of the pharmaceutical industry of the UK no longer being part of the EMA after the UK leaves the EU. He says, and this is a government minister on the record in Parliament, in the negotiations, the government will discuss with the EU and member states and member states how best to continue to cooperate in the fields of medicines regulation. So there is a position on the record from the UK government, uh, which is uh, somewhat at odds from the it's all going to be a hard Brexit position, which uh, the uh, seems to be what's emanating from the EMA following the European Council position. So I think it's important to to pause and consider what this uh, this series of information means. And if I can give you my take on it, it's a personal take, so, uh, so I give you that caveat. I'm not surprised that the EMA have issued the guidance that they have, but I think they're doing this because they have to be at the service of the EU Commission, who themselves are at the position, who are positioning for a negotiation to which they do not know an outcome. And although this documentation seems definitive, it's only preparation for only one of one possible outcomes, which I don't think is the only potential outcome of Brexit. It is the position which would have to take place if there was a hard Brexit, a no deal Brexit, if you like, uh, in, the, in the parlance. And I think there is room in the, um, in the communications for a deal, but what would happen in any future deal uh, is not set out. So I think when you look at these documents from the EMA, it's important to understand that this is, uh, it is uh, a clear way forward, but it's a clear way forward if you believe that a hard Brexit with no deal is the only thing that's going to happen. And I think that I would counsel that that is one possible outcome, but it's not the only possible outcome. I think this is compounded by the fact that the general election in the UK means that the UK is difficult for them to come out uh, and state a preferred position on medicines regulation. We don't know who's going to win the election or what nature of the, the government that will come out. And there may be some personnel changes in that government. So, Whereas a month ago, I was hoping that we'd see a, a clear position from the UK government uh, uh, by the beginning of June on medicines regulation and where they wanted to go. I'm not sure we're going to get that in definitive terms, but I refer you to the previous slide uh, and the parliamentary answer as a best guess as to how I believe, and this is my interpretation, my highlighting of their answer, where I think their thinking is at at the moment. Interestingly, in a sense, you have now got the position where the EU27 are preparing for a hard Brexit, and a Brexiteer UK, gov UK government are postulating the notion of a deal. So uh, I think that's where we're that's where we're at. I would say that if we were to end up in the uh, in the uh, no deal Brexit scenario, the EU 27 alone, uh, that's not the preferred position of, of industry. And I've checked this back with uh, with members and with others. Um, and these are some of the reasons why that outcome might not perhaps be the best uh, interests of the uh, of the industry. It would be duplicative schemes, which could lead to extra expense for industry. Certainly, I think the important, the, the most important argument is that it would be worse for patients. Any uh, regulatory scheme in which was EU 27 alone would mean it would lose about 50, access to about 15% of its pharmacovigilance data, which comes from the UK, which means that uh, just by a simple strength of, of data, it would be less strong. I think there are also some capability challenges uh, across the agencies within the EU 27. Um, at least for a period which will be difficult to replicate speedily. Uh, and I think this is about practical way in which, uh, in which medicines regulation is done. The MHRA has been an important um, player in that scene. Uh, it's certainly possible for Europe to do it without the UK, but I think to do it at the speed and scale, uh, and particularly with some of the, the, the skill sets, particularly around inspections, I think it will be difficult to do easily. Uh, and I think it will be a challenge. Um, and I think also uh, the, the communication from the EMA um, implicitly suggests that there may well be some more integration, some opportunities to do some new ways of working, which will be driven by, uh, uh, by a no deal Brexit. I think that doing some of those things at speed and scale with all the other things the EMA is doing at the moment, the clinical trial regulation, falsifiers medicines directive, the slippage that we've seen in some of the timeframes on those, I think being able to do those 
at the time frame that is envisaged in the original document may be harder than anticipated. I, I think they could do it, but um, these are not straightforward things to do, and we, we know how hard and complex they can be. So that's why uh, the industry position uh, on, on medicines regulation and Brexit remains the same, which is whatever the location of the European Medicines Agency, uh, we believe that close alignment on medicines regulation is in the best interests of both the UK and the EU. So during the, um, uh, during the uh, back to the general election campaign, uh, what we've been doing is we've been uh, reminding the parties of the UK's position during the campaign. Uh, we stand ready to engage with the new government when it's formed, and we've done background work uh, continuing on some of the key issues around life science issues going on. Uh, do keep up uh, if you're interested with our website. Uh, uh, keep going with uh, my uh, weekly uh, newscasts on Monday. I hope they're of use. And we have done uh, the now more than ever report, which is uh, makes the case for delivering the accelerated access review speedily uh, on the website. Do have a look at that if you're interested. I don't think it's the uh, we're the only sectors having issues and pushing them with government. Uh, you can see that, uh, uh, as you're probably aware, that financial uh, finance the finance sector has been talking heavily about the impact of, uh, of Brexit and some of the plans there. Likewise, the airlines and others have been doing it. So um, we're keen to make sure that uh, the, the, the um, particular um, needs, voice, and, um, uh, and particularities of the life science sector are, uh, are front and centre for the new UK government when they return from the election and uh, look forward to, to doing so. But I think it's interesting to see where other sectors are at. And... Uh, what happens next? Um, I've just put here, Act 1, Scene 3 is a long way to go. You'll remember I took this one from the BBC website last time round, and if you think about it, we're still really only in that Phase 1. Uh, you know, the UK has invoked Article 50. The remaining countries have, uh, have met to discuss withdrawal, and we haven't even got to the stage where there's really the sense of two negotiations uh, beginning uh, yet. So we're sort of at that between Number 1 and Number 2 here, and as you can see, there's several other points to go. So um, I think we are still at an early stage if some of the areas are, uh, are becoming slightly clearer. In terms of European elections, the other factor that we've got to think about here is whether the EU27 in their leadership uh, uh, will change uh, during the time of the negotiations and the impact that that may have. Uh, obviously, we've seen the development in France uh, with the presidential elections. Um, no main party through to the, the second ballot the runoff uh, this weekend between Macron and Le Pen, uh, uh, you'll all see the outcome there. Um, the opinion polls suggest that uh, Macron is in the lead. There's then ele legislative elections uh, in June for the National Assembly in, uh, in France. That may well have a, uh, an impact and will, it'll be interesting to see where, um, uh, where Melecon's uh, extreme left group gets to uh, with that one. And it's interesting also to see that uh, Angela Merkel's CDU party seems to have um, revived in the polls uh, at this stage compared to uh, a couple of months ago. But um, the page of money and takes your choice with uh, opinion polls and where they get to. I just think we, we all know that these are uh, coming at us. If I may, uh, what can you do to help life science get the best deal? I think that we're at a moment where we have to just pause and remind people there's a long way to go. There isn't a final position on medicines regulation. There isn't a final deal on anything at the moment. And industry's position hasn't changed uh, as a result of the things that we've seen. So I would, uh, I would countenance that the, the, the ask of you is to continue to make the case that close alignment on medicines regulation is in the best interests of both the UK and remaining EU population. Primarily because of safety, because the best pharmacovigilance needs all the data and we want to minimize the disruption uh, on supply of medicines. So uh, if, you are, uh, if you are talking to, to colleagues globally or you're uh, in the corridors of power, whether they be in Brussels, Westminster, um, Berlin, Paris or elsewhere, remind people of the desire for the e of the UK, and certainly of industry for uh, close continued alignment and cooperation between the EMA and the MHRA that uh, there is going to be disruption and expense and suboptimal patient outcomes if uh, the no deal scenario as presented by the uh, EMA and commission papers of this month were to be there. And of course, why are we seeing this? Because politics is at the moment is at the fore. Um, I wouldn't uh,
discount uh, a pragmatic solution coming out uh, in the wash, but I don't think that's what we're seeing discussed at the moment. And vitally, the whole purpose of our industry is to prov provide product to patients. We need to make sure that we have that front and center in our discussion around all of these things at the end of our supply chains, at the end of our uh, development work, at the end of our regulatory work is a patient in need of a, uh, a therapy. And that's what we are doing this for. And all of us should think about what this means um, uh, uh, over the coming weeks and months. So where are we at as of uh, a week ahead of the, uh, the uh, Eurovision contest? For those of you who are uh, fans of that, uh, we are in a period of further rhetoric and bombast. And I think that's seen around the briefings around the Juncker May meeting and then how that's played out into the politics of the UK general election. We do have clear terms of negotiation from the EU27 and that's led to the EMA setting out its vision as to what companies need to do if there's no deal, if that's the potential future way of working. I think the UK general election has thrown some uncertainty into this uh, for a few period, period of weeks, but uh, we're probably not that many weeks away from then perhaps having a period of greater clarity about the future composition of the UK government that will negotiate Brexit. And as the European Council have always said, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed and we have a long, long way to go. So with that, um, I'm happy to take some questions and I hope that that's been of use to you on a Friday afternoon. I've been asked, have you done a poll on who will get the EMA and why? And the answer to that is no, I haven't. Um, uh, I, I see that there's lots of uh, uh, of rabid uh, electioneering, not just in the UK general election, but by various uh, cities and countries to get the, the, the EMA. Um, we've always taken the view, really since the time of Brexit, that we would imagine that if there was a, uh, uh, a vote to leave the, the EU, that it would be inconceivable politically for the EMA to remain in London. Uh, I don't really think from a BIA perspective, we, um, we have a, a preference or a strong view or would expect to be able to to influence that outcome. Uh, I know industry colleagues who work through FPR and Europa Bio may have, uh, may have views um, on that. I think uh, it's likely to be a decision taken by the European Council, perhaps as early as June, but perhaps with a framework in June for a decision in October. So I think we may, we may get to a decision on that quite quickly. I think what's more important for us is how does the process work and what's the alignment between those processes with regard to the UK. And that's where we're putting our effort and uh, energy at this stage. Any other questions or have I satisfied your needs at this stage? Um, I do hope that you find this, uh, this useful. Um, do please um, uh, tell us what else you're interested in. Uh, I think we'll look next month to talk a little bit more about issues around trade and issues around people and potentially visas. What would, uh, what would that look like? Um, I'd be unsurprised to see a Home Office consultation on visas coming soon, so uh, we'd be happy to, to engage uh, on that. Um, another question. Has the BIA and its members already been discussing industry's position uh, with regard to future regulation? Uh, the answer is yes, yes we have. We've been fully engaged with, um, uh, with our members uh, on that, really since the, since the, the, the discussion last year around um, uh, with the, the process around what would what would regulatory environments look like? Um, I think that's why we're uh, we're pushing very hard for the closest possible alignment between uh, a future UK scheme and um, uh, and the European uh, system um, uh, and uh, our regulatory affairs committee uh, uh, regularly meet and provide me with expert input into what that could look like and what the uh, what the issues are there. We're also engaged uh, closely with the ABPI. Uh, Ginny H does a, a great job from, from, from their side in uh, pulling that community together. And together we are engaged with the UK government uh, in um, a series of officials meetings about uh, how best to handle this and what may be the, the shape of things going forward. Those meetings continue both uh, at official level um, uh, during the election period and we expect to see uh, new ministers on this issue uh, as soon as they are appointed. Um, when will it become too late for clarity to emerge on a pragmatic solution, i.e. when will industry have to act in the absence of a clear direction of travel in the negotiations for further UK cooperation in the European regulatory system? Uh, great question. Uh, many thanks for that. 
Um, I don't think it's too late now. Um, I, I, I'm pushing for uh, clarity to emerge on what a pragmatic solution could do. Um, I'm conscious that um, that uh, industry needs time to, to prepare uh, for whatever any future scenario will be. That's why we were very keen to have a minister from the UK come and talk at our, uh, our reg, reg conference, which I, I think now will probably have to move as a result of the general election because it was on polling day. Uh, I think this is a, a priority that we need clarity on um, as soon as possible, and I would certainly hope to see it uh, or some degrees of, uh, of it um, uh, across the summer. I think you know you, you can't rule out the fact that there will be a deal done, and we are going to have to live with some degree of uncertainty um, uh, for a period of time, and I just think that's the nature of it. Um, so uh, I'm keen that people um, have that clarity on what an alternative could be. I'm afraid I'm not in a position to give you that that today, but I think it would be uh, more straightforward than uh, than something that was radically rad a, a radical change. And I know that um, companies are. Uh, are preparing themselves for um, uh, for what will be some changes at the very least uh, anyway, and I, I fully understand that. What would be useful from my perspective is if people have got um, um, stories or able to share where they've got to in terms of their own thinking, if that's changed in uh, in the last couple of months, it's always useful for me to get from you guys a, a sense as to, uh, as to where you're at and what your concerns are, and also particularly if you've got timelines that you're working towards, because I'll be able to feed that into uh, into the discussions that we're having. Thank you. I think at that point I'm going to say uh, uh, have a good weekend. Um, if you are interested in uh, meeting face to face, we've got some uh, of these upcoming events. Uh, our CEO and investor forum uh, at the end of May in Oxford is a. Uh, we'll have uh, some discussion of, uh, of of Brexit as part of the uh, a part of the the, the, the agenda there. Um, we have a great women in biotech networking evening in, in June. Those of you who are travelling to bio. Uh, please come and support the Brexit panel that I'm on uh, on the 20th of June. Um, our summer networking uh, reception is on the 6th of, uh, of July. I, I think we'll be in a good position to understand uh, where the new government is by then. And two dates for the for the autumn. Uh, the Bioscience Forum is our, our major conference, 12th of October. Do mark it in your diary. Um, I'm sure we'll be in a good position to know uh, next steps on many of these issues uh, by then. And if you're into manufacturing and bioprocessing, uh, the end of November in Cardiff is always a highlight. Um, I hope that's been of use. Uh, if you're interested uh, in, uh, in even further engagement, do feel free to, to join us. Um, Jane would love to hear from you uh, if you're not a member already. And uh, the next uh, briefing that we plan to do on this uh, will be post the week after the election, uh, which will be Thursday the 15th of June, uh, post the election and before bio in our world. Uh, at a similar slot. So I hope we'll be able to uh, update you uh, on who's won and uh, some of the other things will move forward. I hope that's been of use. Uh, many thanks for joining us and look forward to speaking to you next month.